comprehension, like a flower, must unfold at its own pace. Until a person is ready to see the truth, even the clearest logic will not make it acceptable to him. Good morning, everyone. So, whom and when is it appropriate to give these teachings to? Or apply to ourselves, how ready are we spiritually? It's kind of the import of today's topic, how democratic is the truth. And as you heard in the reading today, Jesus is, is, is rather um, firm about what he asks us to do. Uh, neither, cast, uh, you, uh, neither ye cast your pearls before swine, uh, he says. And the Swami says, he's saying that in the sense of a robust, almost humorous conversation. Uh, sometimes when humor is written down, it's like, hmm, well, what, did, what did you just say? But in the context, it, yeah, it's, uh, he's trying to make a point there. Um, but on the face of it, we have to admit that it appears a little scandalous. Uh, used as we are uh, to have the ability to look up the sum total of human knowledge by a mere Google search, um, why is this advice being given? But the plot thickens. If you look at where this particular verse comes from, it's from Matthew uh, chapter 7. And Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of Jesus' most famous discourse. He only gives five during the course of his brief ministry. And the most famous of them, of course, is the Sermon on the Mount. And chapter 5, he begins to talk about Beatitudes. And later on, he talks about how to pray and the meaning of the commandments and um, how to do charity, let not your right hand know what your left is doing or left know what the right is doing, however it comes. And then he goes on to say, don't judge other people. And then he says, don't give these people, don't give these teachings to people that may not be undeserving. But right after that, immediately after that, he says, ask and it shall be given to you. Not just that, it goes on to say, everybody that ask it, receive it. So the, the plot thickens. Okay? It thickens even more. I'll tell you why. Many hundreds of years before Jesus, many thousands of miles away in India, Krishna also gave his most famous discourse, which we, of course, know as the Bhagavad Gita. And it has 18 chapters, and he says all kinds of wonderful things in all of those chapters. And in the 18th chapter, the 18th chapter has 72 verses. And in verse number 67, he says, don't share these teachings willy-nilly. Okay? And he uses some good Sanskrit terms. He doesn't actually say willy-nilly, uh, although he might as well have. He says, don't give these teachings to one that lacks self-control, that lacks devotion, that speaks ill of me, meaning speaks ill of God, blames God for their troubles, and then one who doesn't listen and one who is not of service to others. That's 1867. And in 1866, he says, forsaking all other dharmas, surrender to me alone. For sure, do not grieve, I will grant you liberation. Uh, other than the change in the order of the verses, both these great masters across centuries, whose words have resonated with us even today and will continue to do so, after giving, ev saying everything that needs to be said, they say the two exact same things. That, hey, all you need to do is ask, but hey, don't give it to everybody. Do you see how, how thick the plot is here? There is something going on. We need to flesh it out a little bit. So that's what I'll try to do. Uh, social trends are like a pendulum swing. So they, um, they kind of go to one extreme in one direction. And the society as a whole realizes, hmm, 
no, that's not working. It needs to change. And the pendulum begins to swing the other way. And we go all the way to the other extreme because we are enthusiastic. Say, hmm, that isn't working either. And then if we remember history properly, we'll probably come back to the middle. Often we don't, and we might swing again. Back in the Middle Ages and before that, these sacred teachings were in manuscript form and they were a closely guarded secret. You needed to be ordained or part of a secret society or as in Christendom, part of the Catholic Church and have a specific title. It was written in Latin, some manuscript somewhere. In India, it was written in Sanskrit, again in some manuscript. You had to be born into a particular caste. And it, it, the teachings of these great masters of God were received through the intermediary of some certain egos. It has to be, otherwise it would be a guru and another self-realized master. And, and also through the collective ego of certain organizations. And obviously that's not good. So the pendulum began to uh, swing. I was about to say sing. I don't know if pendulum <laughs> sings. It certainly began to swing. Gutenberg invented the printing press. And you know the first book that was printed, you all know this, it was the Bible. And that, of course, immediately, more or less immediately, led to the Reformation. And these teachings began to be more available. And very, very soon, the pendulum swing continued and it encouraged a personal relationship with God instead of some random intermediaries. And this happened all across the world, not just in Christendom. And then it swung some more. And now in the last 40 years, we are at an age where you truly, really can find any teaching you want in any language. I, I, look, I looked it up yesterday in Google. You can find Jesus' teachings in Aramaic, which was the language that he spoke. You can find Krishna's teachings in Sanskrit, which was the language that he spoke, or in any vernacular that uh, you might be more familiar with. It's all available right there. The pendulum has fully swung to the other side. Has it or is that where it is supposed to be? That's, that's kind of the question. What it has done is this easy access to all of these information, all of these teachings, has created a new issue. I'll stop short of calling it a problem. Eventually I'll call it a problem, but let me be more neutral and call it an issue right now. It's created a new issue. That issue is, are we capable of comprehending the information that's presented to us? Notice I didn't say understanding, I said comprehending. Uh, to give you a simple example, say you have a mole on your hand, on your arm, or you're feeling fatigued or something, and you go to Google and look it up. What happens? Well, you could convince yourself that you have some mortal disease and only have days to live. Or you could convince yourself that there's absolutely nothing wrong. Isn't that true? And the reason is because we have, the, this is the tendency of the mind uh, or the heart that we've already decided what we feel about something. We either do this Google search with a, a feeling of fear or with a feeling of denial, just to take the two things. And that's what the information will tell us, uh, you see. So therein lies the, the issue becomes a little more of a problem with freely available spiritual teachings. I'm not talking about that they should be censored. I'm just saying uh, cautioning the readiness uh, or intake of that information that's available is we are most likely to adapt those teachings to our convenience, okay? Uh, I don't want to meditate today. And I can do a Google search and find many, many reasons not to meditate. <laughs> Depending on what specific rationalization I'm looking for, uh, or if I want many because I need to convince somebody, then I can find all of that, can I not? If I want to do something, mm, weird and say, I want to fast for 15 days, I've just decided somehow that lead me to enlightenment. I can do a Google search and 
find lots of reasons why that's good. In fact, I did do a Google search yesterday on this. You'll be amazed at the kind of compelling reason there exists to do utterly stupid things. <laughs> okay? And <laughs> um, in the material world, in the case of the mole on my hand, I can always go to a more skilled person, a doctor, who's trained in this. In the spiritual world, it's a little different. Certainly, attending satsangs and uh, gathering with other people who have perhaps done this for longer is helpful. But because of our incredible ability, I shouldn't say ability, but habitual inclination, propensity, to adapt these teachings to our convenience, what is required when we are in doubt is not more knowledge, in fact, that's counterproductive, but self-discipline, self-control. Because the, um, often what is required is something that we probably wouldn't like to do. It is so much easier to lash out in anger and it, it's, it's quite pleasurable in, in the mid-lash, right in the midst of that overpowering anger. If you, if you stop for a moment and, and examine yourself, it's actually very pleasurable. It occupies the same mind space of dopamine hit that a piece of chocolate would occupy. It, it, the next time that happens, just kind of see uh, how your mind savors uh, that, that thing that we are doing. And of course, you can find reasons for it. But it takes self-control to say, huh, maybe that's not the right thing. It takes a lot of self-control to replace it with blessing or uh, empathy, for example. So the teachings freely available and the problem that could potentially create the, the doorway, the, the gateway through which they should enter should be the door of self-control, minimally, okay? But, um, see, this, what self-control does is it, it broadens the context that if we approach it purely from the context of likes and dislikes, then, of course, you can say, yeah, everything is, everything is God, so no matter what I do, uh, it cannot possibly be wrong. I could say even great masters lashed out in anger because it was good for their devotees. And that's what I'm going to do. And probably have had thought somewhere along these lines uh, through our spiritual life. So self-control broadens the context and takes us beyond likes and dislikes. Because the paths to God needs a bit of a high altitude view. We need to look at it from a much higher viewpoint. Does that end the problem? What about if you, if you had Wikipedia of all these teachings along with self-control, is that enough? I, I'm just kind of deliberately uh, saying it that way. Uh, it, it may not be because of this little thing called karma. The context cannot be limited to, limited by mortality. It cannot be limited by birth and death because how we react goes significantly beyond that. Swami Kriyananda, whose teachings we follow here, he, he has this anecdote in his autobiography, The Path. And he says, um, uh, at that point, Master, that is uh, the Yogananda, his guru, and uh, but disciples refer to, with reverence, refer to him as Master. And Master was writing a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. And every now and then he would write a thing which says, this passage means so and so. And in the very next sentence, he would write, on the other hand, it also means so and so, where the second meaning was very different, not at all related to the first one. And Swamiji, who was the editor, he was looking at this. And he said, suddenly, suddenly, he had doubt. It didn't exist before. And then doubt came. And then he had the thought, 
that my master lacks wisdom. And he said, it didn't diminish his thinking of how spiritually elevated master was, nor did it take away from the loyalty. But Swamiji desperately wanted to get rid of it, this doubt. But self-control wouldn't help it. Thou shalt not doubt, didn't help. It was, it was there, he said, I would have done anything to get rid of it, but it wouldn't go. And he was ashamed to admit it to master. Now what happens next is very interesting. So he goes up, uh, he's sitting with master, and one day master just looks at him and gravely he says, you doubt now because you have doubted in the past. Uh, and remember Swamiji hadn't told him anything. And that's a bit of a moment of um, epiphany, revelation for Swamiji because uh, he, he realizes two things. One, uh, he says that the way Master wrote the commentaries are, it's, it's the Indian approach to documenting the truth, if you will, that you don't give a single definition because that way you are limiting a multifaceted truth into a single context. You try and give all ways of looking at it and therefore unless you are attuned to it or meditating on it from a pure intellectual perspective, it might seem absurd. The second thing that he realizes which is more relevant to us is that when Master said that you have doubted before, he didn't mean you've doubted yesterday or five years ago, but this was the intellectual doubt was a thing that happened, that has happened through multiple lifetimes. And then he realizes that's why Master told him that he would, uh, a, a, a large part of his life would be in writing and giving talks and so on. In other words, to overcome the karma of intellectual doubt, faith was not enough. He had to work to dispel the doubts in other people. These are, these are Swamiji's words. They see, you see, uh, dwell on that for a moment. The context need, needs to be that broad when we look at these teachings. When we, the next time you do a Wikipedia search on Sermon on the Mount or Karma Yoga in the Bhagavad Gita or whatever, it is said in the context of eternity itself. Nothing less will do. Now that's bad news, isn't it? Because how could we possibly know? A bit, I mean, okay, I don't want to meditate today. Is it because some karmic thing that happened 500 lifetimes ago? I have no clue because I have no memory what I was 500 lifetimes ago. Maybe I was meditating, maybe I was a dung beetle. I don't really know. <laughs> so what do we do there? But fortunately, it's not this complicated or this grim because there is something else that simplifies this vastly for us. And what that is, is we have within us to know the truth when we see it. Again, um, this is why I have my notes with me. I want to read uh, verbatim from uh, Swamiji's experience. We all know this. Swamiji read the autobiography of a yogi and then it uh, brought things together so perfectly uh, answered everything that the next day he took a bus and went off to Los Angeles from New York. But let me highlight some parts of that experience. So while reading Autobiography of a Yogi, Swamiji said, miracles abound in this book. Many of them, I confess, were quite beyond my powers of acceptance at the time. Instead of dismissing them, however, as I would certainly have done had I read about them in almost any other book, I suspended my incredulity. So the spirit of the book was so clearly truthful, Swamiji says, that his doubts didn't matter. So he describes what it feels like to realize that he was reading truth. Okay, what it feels like. Understanding's got nothing to do with it. He says, Every page seemed radiant with light. I alternated between tears of laughter, tears of pure joy, laughter of even greater joy, 
For three days, I scarcely ate or slept because he recognized the truth. Not in his head, most certainly not in his head because the context for that is very, very limiting, uh, but through the faculty of intuition. Um, and what did the heart do? It immediately responded with loyalty, with love, and more importantly, most importantly, longing that I have to be with him right away. So he said, I didn't want to make an impulsive decision because he said, who oh, I? So he waited for an entire day <laughs> before he jumped on a bus and took a four day cross country trip. So there is self control on the one hand to broaden the context, but there is this ability for us to know the truth with which generates longing. What's the name for that? Well, it has two things, devotion and receptivity. Though that is, that is the simplifying factor. That's the back door uh, and, and that's kind of the key that uh, the, the modern problem of freely available information has the obvious, though not easy, solution of devotion, receptivity, and self-control. Uh, hand in hand with that are two more things. These are very short and then that will end my talk. It's all about broadening the context. We really have to see our place in our spiritual evolution and our relationship to God and Guru in the context of eternity because that is both where we came from and where we are going. Uh, mortality being limited, meaning body consciousness, or body consciousness is the same as ego because as Yogananda said that ego is simply soul identified with the body. To broaden that context, service. service the spirit of service, as Krishna says, making that an integral part of our spiritual pursuits. When we serve others immediately, the context is broadened. You see what I'm saying? It's, it, it, it's hard uh, no, for it to not be broadened. Okay? The other one, it, most interestingly, Krishna says, don't give these teachings to one that speaks ill of me, meaning speaks ill of God. What that means is that we are on the spiritual path, but there is still a little bit of transactional consciousness, quite a bit of transactional consciousness left, which says, Lord, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm meditating. I'm serving other people. I'm doing all kinds of things that I didn't like. And implicit in that is, you told me that I'm not going to suffer anymore. But yet, why do I have this big, huge problem? Why am I bearing this cross? I blame you. That's again, not looking at it from the karmic context that perhaps that um, need to lash out at somebody or the need to sleep instead of meditate. Um, maybe it's got not so much to do with that somebody who caused it or uh, how tired I feel right at this moment, but it's probably the challenge, the, the, the karmic habit by overcoming of that we will actually feel stronger and freer. So uh, how democratic is the truth? Well, it is democratic in the sense, uh, you know, even in democracy, you have to, you have to attain the voting age. Uh, I, I always forget whether you are allowed to drink alcohol at 18 and vote at 21, or it's the other way around. I think you're allowed to vote at 18. Um, what, you, you still have to attain that voting age. So this attainment of the voting age in this context has these five aspects to it, primarily devotion and receptivity, self-control, service, spirit of service, and not being too quick to blame somebody else, God, for our troubles. So these are the five things, and I'll end again with this quote from Swami. He says, 
comprehension, like a flower, must unfold at its own pace until a person is ready to see the truth, even the clearest logic will not make it acceptable to him.